Okay, well, we just took a 10-minute break, and uh, just as things will go with a presentation like this, a uh, computer dropped out, the internet connection went away, and we're back online, so uh, bear with us here. Um, so we're now into the territory of talking about the technocratic rollout, the transhumanist agenda, and right center forward in front of our eyes is DARPA, which is, uh, for those that have studied it, is pretty much, what would you call it, the brains of the AI rollout. They're the ones investigating uh, all this AI technology, the robotics, the war machines, the uh, advanced microprocessors. And uh, this is some information that you had, Alfred, so maybe you want to talk about it because uh, we're talking about timelines here too. Yeah, and this is very interesting because it intersects with a, um, a uh, DARPA time travel program that uh, uh, a, a whistleblower, a, co a colleague of ours actually, Andrew the Bishago, and he was a childhood participant of it back in 1971. And so we know all about DARPA's forward time base from 19, that, where Andy used to go as a childhood time traveler, uh, a chrononaut, from 1971 to DARPA's forward time base in the year 2045 to retrieve time scrolls from 2045 to bring them back to 1971 to help 1971 get to 2045 successfully. Uh, and by successfully, I assume, is, uh, you know, through all of, of what the invading AI is trying to th throw at us. So we'll go with that kind of basic assumption, that basic good faith assumption, um, even though there's a lot of information to show that AI and AI and trained individuals and, and, and agencies and institutions have used time travel to further the AI agenda and for manipulatory purposes. The reason I bring all of this up on this slide is to introduce uh, uh, Ray Kurzweil, who's one of, the, one of the kind of high priest figures. He's the head of artificial intelligence for Google. And I think you can't get any closer to black goo than Google, Google, <laughs> get it, Google. And people who think that, oh, there goes Alfred again. <laughs> I urge you to go into the deeper ways that artificial intelligence functions. Of course, it would work with a Google Plex to make itself known and to make one of the major AI and train companies known as Google. <laughs> Self advertisement is part of the game of mm -hmm. AI intelligence. So, one of the principal spokespersons for the, um, the transhumanist agenda, although they see themselves, it's like, you know, if you get inside the war economy, peace is war, you know, or war is peace. If you get inside the transhumanist agenda, um, uh, oh, we at Google are actually, uh, artificial intelligence is one of the greatest dangers to mankind. <laughs> you see, it's, you have to get into the head of doublespeak. Mm -hmm. and, exactly, and, and understand that. And artificial intelligence is is a real trickster, and it's into double speak. And um, you know, humans uh, really maybe that's why I was born as a Cuban. We're we're a little bit hip, more hip to double speak 
having, uh, I don't know why, we, because, you know, we change hands so many sides, mm -hmm. so many times our indigenous population was slaughtered in this small little island that, you know, your deception, you're a little bit hip, more hip to deception. And you don't get hornswoggled by, oh, President Kennedy was just shot by a lone assassin. <laughs> These yeah. tourists from Afghanistan just came down. We knocked down the World Trade Center, so now we're going to have to invade the whole world. <laughs> well, there's you nothing we can me. do about it. There's nothing we can do about it because poor old Georgie Bush, who's a psychopath from Yale, he was on the campus while I was there. Well, he's a good man. Gee. <laughs> <laughs> That's scary. That, that scared me, Alfred. <laughs> Good rendition of an AI speak. Um, can I ask you a question so I can understand this a little better? What is the 2045 singularity? What is it that they really want to do? Yeah. Driving us down an artificial intelligence timeline? Is there at a point where there's no return? What are they speaking about? Aside from the 24th of May, 24-5 being Queen Victoria's birthday and kind of the planetary reptilian thing. And the 24th of May, of course, is Bob Dylan's birthday and mine. So you have to get into the deeper layers of why they would choose 2045. And so why did DARPA choose 2045 for its forward time base? Those mm -hmm. are all big questions. Okay? okay, like if you go start opening a, a, a newspaper and start looking at why so many things end in 2045 or 542, I mean, it, it, it begin to look at the patterns if you really want mm -hmm. to understand how this world has been infiltrated and how time has been corrupted. Okay. So Ray Kurzweil who was a contractor, computer contractor. Uh, I think he's part of the international Zionist conspiracy agenda. Uh, all of a sudden gets a job at Google uh, as the head of artificial intelligence at Google. And they cook up something that says, oh, by 2045, we estimate that um, that's the time that artificial intelligence and humans are going to be equal. And that's the singularity. Okay. When man okay. and machine meet. Okay. Right. And that's, that's the singularity. And you can go to 2045.com, which is funded by a Russian billionaire. And you can actually click on a point where they'll start creating the robot into which you can deposit your consciousness if you want. Right, and I've seen that. Okay, so okay. I just wanted to make that clear. And then to kind of where we're going to go with what DARPA has been harvesting or harnessing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. but I, I, I want to say that 2045, it's like 666. Why 66, 666? Yeah. And why do you see Route 666? And why do you see 666 all over the place? Okay, uh -huh. it's like 2045. It's one of these numbers that artificial intelligence traveling back and forth over timelines injects in multiple contexts. So as soon as you see 2045, you know something that's up. So I'm trying to communicate this level in uh -huh. explaining this. Sure. Line. sure. But they also need us to have that locked into our consciousness, too. Right. I mean, they, that, so they're using these numbers that have a, uh, what's the right word? They have a magical quality to it. They have a subliminal quality. They have a message behind it. There's a whole agenda behind a number. Yeah. So yeah. walking it, it in. Right. Yeah. And that's all. So. Yeah. yeah. But and, it has so, and so uh, uh, one of the alternative meanings of 2045, it's very odd that Google suddenly came up with 2045 when those of us who have been studying the uh, quantum access field, which is where you access the quantum of the time-space continuum uh, or the time-space hologram, uh, 2045 
is where your forward time base is. It's mm-hmm. like if you're an explorer and you say, okay, we're, ex- you know, you're an explorer back in uh, an old century. And you say, mm-hmm. okay, we're exploring South America and our, our central exploration base is going to be in Rio de Janeiro Bay. And, you, and if you ever get lost in South America, always head for Rio de Janeiro Bay. Okay, that's 2045 because you're exploring time space, not just space. Mm-hmm. Right, so they've hooked the point in time space continuum where they're trying to drive this thing to. So, so there, it's, it's, why is Google, why is Ray Kurzweil, and why is this entire industry conflating the year 2045 as the technological singularity when AI and humanity are going to blend with DARPA's forward time base, which is where supposedly, according to DARPA's time travel program, that's the base that was keeping humanity safe by sending messages from 2045 by a human time travelers like Andy Bishago back to 1971 forward. They even set my book Exopolitics back to 1971 as one of the things that would keep humanity safe. Uh, uh, why would they why why would Ray Kurzweil say 2045 and not say, oh, by the way, that's DARPA's forward time base, and we've got it all secured because there's fo- because the future has known all about artificial intelligence and it's going to keep us safe. Why doesn't it why doesn't Kurzweil do that? Because Kurzweil is AI and trained. Mm-hmm. Here's one hypothesis. And the true surge year of artificial intelligence is not 2045, but it's 30 years earlier in 2015. And that's why we're speaking up now. And that's why all these symposiums have suddenly come forward in 2015. I think there's something, I think there's something else significant, actually. Mm The name Kurzweil, um, it's a German word, which means short while, short time. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. (laughs) Right. So. Very. Right. So, Albert, let's let's play the timeline aspect of it or or maybe Jeffrey can bring into this too because time seems to be one of those uh, conceptual realities that we as humans are trying to understand what is time, right? So there's models built, there's scientific study and we also know that time can be bent. We know that it can uh, be changed. We know it unfolds. We know it's not linear. We know a lot of things about time. So when we're looking at a because this came up with us today specifically that the sense, the inner human sense is that there is a very specific moment in time that we as conscious beings need to, it's like a kink got put in the road. That's how I can describe it. And maybe it is this DARPA, that DARPA has already gone back and at this kink juncture and they've already put the AI influence there, right? They've already captured that, that moment in time. So wanting to function us into it. So I'm just bringing it up, like playing with that in, in our conscious field. How do we change times at lines? What, how, what happens there? How do we keep ourselves from, you know, being, becoming these cyborg elements? Or, it's a question to throw out. That, that's a very key question. In mm-hmm. other words, we're being hoodwinked. Mm-hmm. Don't don't forget that all of the executives in the DARPA time travel program, they have names like um, like uh, uh, Richard M. Nixon. They have names uh, like 
the fellow who was Secretary of Defense on 9-11. And the people who were involved and informed in that program have names like George H.W. Bush, George W. Bush. Mm -hmm. Uh, This is the crowd that was briefed on future events as seen by either the chronovisors or one of the eight other types of time travel technology. They're individuals who are already AI and trained. And the National Security Advisor at that time in the Richard Nixon cabinet overseeing the time travel program was named Henry A. Kissinger who went on to become an intimate advisor of the Rothschilds. So that then you have the most AI and trained humans have inside knowledge going back to 1971 of future events like 9-11 and like 2045. So they can set human society on a trajectory for 9-11 9-11 to make sure that that occurs and on, and on a trajectory for 2045 to make sure that that occurs. So you've asked the most key question. Are we allowing Google, Google, Ray Kurzweil, there's only a short while left for the human race, right. Bill Gates keeper. Right to now railroad the human race on a, an accelerated timeline straight into the 2045 that is the analogy of the September 11, 2001, the last milestone that they railroaded us into, that they had advanced time travel information of, in 1971, Uh, and and, uh, uh, is that what the case is here? I hope I'm communicating. I know that these are very abstract concepts, but Mm -hmm. they're based on actual research that we'll go into. Right. And it's trying to forewarn the human race. Am I I being very clear? Could I ask Jeffrey, as the resident scientist, (laughs) could I explain something that makes sense to you? Yeah, actually, um, there's a metaphor in biology. (laughs) Oh, good. (laughs) So, um, you know, I've thought a lot about um, the the idea is that the the cell represents a stereographic projection in three dimensions of a higher dimensional order of being. So, Thinking about this and how cells relate to each other in a body and how how does time travel play into that? And um, the idea is that there are many different um, Earths, okay, on different uh, on in different stages of unfoldment as far as, um, you know, from past to present is concerned. So all of these Earths <coughs> are existing right now in the present moment, but on a parallel timeline, One of the planets may be um, uh, in a stage of unfoldment that's a little before us and others that are right close to us and others that are further away. But all of them are, you know, in this present moment, they're just in these parallel dimensions. The idea is that if we were able to see with our multidimensional goggles, um, the way that these Earths are connected, they're connected like a population of cells is connected, localized in, in the body. So the idea is that if a pathogen is, um, a pathogen infects this population of cells or, or the space that these cells are are um, are in, and this is a multi-dimensional space. I don't know. What, uh, that's I'll just leave it at that. The idea is that these cells communicate with each other. Okay, a virus might infect one cell, and then um, it takes a little longer to infect another cell that's close by to it. So if we think of the, if we think of these cells. Um, in this multi-dimensional body as on separate in separate kind of parallel universes that represent different earths on different stages of unfoldment um, that would mean that on these different 
planets on these parallel timelines that are close to ours and closely connected with ours, that they're um, they're at different stages of the infection sequence and time and events are playing out a little differently on, uh, on in each cell or in each earth in the, in the parallel realities. The thing is, is that in the body, the cells communicate with each other what's going on inside, you know. So um, they can send signaling molecules to each other in the form of uh, proteins or hormones or whatnot. And also the immune system can send hormones um, into the cell uh, when it's infected. And what these hormones do is they, um, they call out information in the, that's encoded in the DNA of the cell um, that's going to help the cell uh, fight off the infection or, or deal with the stressors, the, the environmental stressor that it's dealing with. In this case, it's a pathogen. So um, the idea here is that um, the information that's being called out to, to fight um, the, the pathogen or the infection is part of it is the information that we're bringing out like right now in the symposium and that many people are, are bringing out and working on and that it's, it's bringing out information that's contained in the heart of the earth herself and the nucleus of the earth herself. And um, it's meant to counter the uh, forces that are at work right now. So the idea with cell signaling between um, different cells in the body is that when we talk about um, timelines and, and, and things potentially happening and why they might have happened at a later date or didn't happen, um, the idea as it's connected with the biological model that I just outlined is that um, there's different planets on parallel in parallel universes that are infected with the same type of, of virus, but they're either further along in development or they're further behind and they're sending each other information about what's going on. Um, and it's kind of, uh, this is where, you know, they, they talk about timelines diverging and maybe something occurred on, on a planet that's further along in a parallel universe that's further along in the infection sequence. And it said, okay, this happened and it was bad. You want to avoid this. And so there's a, a signaling mechanism possibly that um, communicates with this earth that says, okay, look out for this. And then, you know, we get these intuitives and these empaths that, um, or these, uh, uh, we get these things that this might happen or that this might happen and then it doesn't come to pass. And then everybody's like, you know, this is, um, you know, bogus or whatever this person was saying is, is bogus. When it could be that, in all reality, if they wouldn't have had the signal from what happened on a parallel timeline, that could have happened. But just the fact that we got information from another planet close to ours in, in terms of what's going on, um, that we avoided, you know, something. Anyway, so it's interesting that there's um, all these, they're, they're, everything's so connected, you know, and it's communicating with each other, just like cells in a body. So, you know, this 2045 deal, you know, there could be, uh, planets on you know parallel timelines and parallel universes that um, 2045 was the date and is the date and was you know an important date and on this timeline maybe it's going to be 2050 or, or 2025 you know there's no um, there's no way of knowing but that's all I can really I mean and that's all speculation but the, there's mm -hmm. still a pattern there and um, a, a metaphor there in their body so um, that's what I would have to, to say to that. Oh. Again, that would come down to the hypothesis that, or what we're putting forward, is that we as conscious beings are the immune response for poor Earth as her intelligent field. And by even just talking about this right now, bringing it into the consciousness, we're already changing it. Mm -hmm. And oh. in, yeah, go ahead. I was just going to add, uh, like what, what I thought is fresh about parallel timelines. The idea here, and this is just um, kind of a, a s conceptual sketch, and it's based on biology, is that this would af affect the way that we think about time travel, um, because the cells in the body are, are connected, they're linked together in certain ways. Um, so the idea is that Earth uh, is connected with itself across multiple dimensions in different ways, and each planet is at its particular stage of unfoldment, but it's all in the present moment. But you might be able to travel, you know, using uh, portals or whatnot. You know, portals would be, there's an equivalent in the body, but you'd be able to kind of jump from one cell to the other. And um, it might be at a different stage of unfoldment. And what you do on that planet would affect um, the way that it communicates back to the, the timeline that you came from. 
So, you know, I, I was, I mean, this kind of is diving a little, um, I mean, it's still a topic, but there, there's a little tangent. It's like, mm-hmm. you know, you talk about the grandfather paradox. What happens if you go back in time and kill your own grandfather? Everybody's thinking that, you know, oh, and all these things, all these weird paradoxes happen that form these, you know, pretzels in your head. But if you think about it like this, it kind of erases those um, in a way. It does away with a lot of that. But, um, and it, it, it ties into biology. It's kind of a stretch, but it's interesting to think about the, the implications of it and how it ties into what we're talking about. So. Deep thoughts to ponder. Yeah. <laughs> you know, they, I mean, they are, they are deep thoughts to ponder and they're worthy of our own investigation. It is a very worthy aspect that we have as humans to be able to take these concepts right now and really take them into who we are. And what emerges out of that, for me at least, is a new expanded, more expanded consciousness and a more interrelatedness, like you were saying, Alfred, with, you know, we've got the the world and the earth and the solar system, and then we go into the, the multiverse and the omniverse and all of that. We actually have that potentiality. It's a very difficult task, however, to bring that into this particular dimension with the limits that we have at the moment. But it is great to ponder. Yeah, you know, and, and just looking at the the insights that Jeffrey uh, just shared, uh, being a person that has followed uh, time travel now for you know the better part of fifteen years or so. Uh, and that follows it daily uh, on, you know, in in the various in the various research groups and that are that are going on. And and I'm in touch with a lot of the major time travelers and researchers. I really believe that Jeffrey's bringing in new and valuable thought here, uh, be, because a lot of current time travel is tied up with at least the conventional language if you look it up on if you look it up on wikipedia and all of that you know they are tied up with the linear model of the grandfather paradox and all of that and that's like being tied up with newtonian physics now and so it, i think that that our way through is is to get in to take these to take these biological models such as Jeffrey has been using and and then to use the lateral thinking and begin to approach time science in that way. And uh, I can say that just based on the discoveries that I've made, why say the magical number December 21st, 2012, why many of the predictions of of the Project Pegasus and the early time travel predictions on which many of the negative projects and negative timeline projects, the AI kind of driven projects of cataclysms and all of these sorts that were really geoengineering driven events rather than natural events, why they have not occurred because the time travel back in the early project, Project Pegasus days, the individuals that were involved in Project Pegasus were using a linear model of time. And so that their technology created a linear model of time. And so that hopefully this 2045 is a technological singularity Kurzweil may or may not be aware of it, but it was it was explored by Project Pegasus using these linear time travel technologies back in 1971. So we're we're not going to go there. It's just like Planet X and you know the end of the world and all of this great catastrophic stuff. That's not where we're going to go because we have a much more multidimensional interactive model, much along the lines of what Jeffrey has talked about. Beautiful. Um, and again, going back to, to Bradley Loves, he, he, he really 
in his thought, has brought out, you know, saying, look, it was Philip Corso's important state, Philip Corso Jr.'s important statements that uh, time as a dimension has been compromised. And this is what everybody in, you know, around the 2005, 2000, say for the past 10 years at all the exopolitical conferences uh, have been saying is that time has been compromised and now we're getting more into the nitty gritty of it but AI has been using time travel and the compromising of time as one of its principal methods of infiltration to our reality and I guess that's that's the principle uh, uh, point in this first in this first paragraph, and people like Philip Corso Jr. getting up and saying it. You know, the more individuals that we can all recognize uh, that get up and say that publicly. You know, many people have lost their lives. Whistleblowers have lost their lives for getting up and saying time has been compromised, or if you, you know, like the control of time has been one of the most deeply held secrets. And I can remember being in Hawaii in the year uh, 2005 at a conference and Andy Bashago, who, uh, uh, you know, calling me there and saying, look, I've just had a meeting with a, a, uh, a delegate, a, a messenger from the Bush, George W. Bush White House. And they say, and they said, if I keep on talking about and going public with time travel, uh, they can't quote, they can't guarantee my physical safety. And that's a direct quote from the Bush White House, which came down from President George W. Bush. So uh, we've been working with whistleblowers like Annie Bashago to keep them alive over the past decade or more. And that's what's going on. So some of the passion that I'm bringing to this conference, to this symposium today, is just to you know, and it's probably part of my Latin blood, is is just to really get the message across that you've had this AI entrained White House and Congress and Supreme Court, and you have characters like the Bush family, whether the Scherf family, I don't know, but um, like the Bush family that have been acting on behalf of AI, they go out and murder and assassinate people like Andy Bashago who, you know, traveled on their behalf as a child to the year 2045 in their linear models, you know, and of, of, time, of time travel machines. And uh, they're trying to murder the people who are trying to save the human race and warn them that they're on a collision course. So mm -hmm. that's what's at stake here. And that, that's a bit of what's behind my passion. And, and so this... This comes again to the AI spokespersons and the disdain that I have for them. Utter disdain, no matter how many billions they have in the bank. It doesn't matter to me. And no matter how many titles, and how much monarchical power they have, it does not matter to me. And, and, um, and that is that if we look at 2015 is the surge year for AI. This is the 2045 that Kurzweil, you know, oh, there's just a short while for the human race. <sighs> they they love that kind of ha ha game, and and uh, 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 2015 is the surge year. And when CCN with Mel Vey and all of our friends there came out, I believe Christine, you were on the panel. Claudia, were you on that that panel? I think. Claudia was on there. Mm -hmm. Harold, a whole number of people, Bert Bradley. Yeah. And, um, um, and then on August 20th, disclosing the threat of AI, Lily was on there, disclosing mm -hmm. the threat of AI. This is a hypothesis. My hypothesis is that AI, which is scanning our timelines, went in and scanned that and then went back. They always double back and get you with overlay realities, went back and 
established a January 1st, 2015 anti-AI public statesman by the principal, one of the principal AI spokespersons, Bill Gates, who in real life is a vaccine genocider. And one of the principles in the depopulation agenda, which is an AI agenda, and uh, stating that, oh, artificial intelligence is one of the greatest threats uh, to humanity more dangerous than nuclear weapons. And right around that time, they had about 100 to 150 luminaries. All of the luminaries in the AI field sign a similar statement. Right. And, and uh, 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 so there, thereby, all of a sudden, you have the fox guarding the hen house, but AI went back and planned it based on the symposiums that our community is bringing out in 2015. And that's why I say that 2015 is the surge year, not 2045. So just to hypothesize for a moment, because I mean, I've certainly through the work that we do on the unseen side of things, have seen how our consciousness is, and we know this already, we know it now that it's there, they're harnessing our brain waves, our thought patterns, they've got all these quantum computing on on planet and in the satellite networks and ships and, and other things that are literally like mind mapping everything here, right? The human consciousness, how the planet responds, how we all respond, our emotional pulses. Basically, that's the rollout that's happening here. They want to be able to monitor absolutely everything the human consciousness is doing. And so when I hear that, Alfred, and I'm aware of it, what I wanted to bring is some one of these aspects that what actual piece of us of source beings can they not touch? And how can we by being a bit random, a bit rebellious, by not having these big, huge, this is not a time for big, huge movements of each of us as individuals. If we all start acting individually, then it's very difficult for this type of uh, a computing-based mentality or intelligence to figure out what's going to happen next. And I feel like within the consciousness of the awakening aware that a lot of us see that and and yet it's a it's a very uh arduous process to become so self-aware yourself that you can operate out of a definite sense of soul sovereignty and and i that will go into some very deeper parts of that later because what you're saying basically is that they've got us so mapped that they go back and they mess with the timeline to get the result they want. So they've already co-opted us in the future. Oh yeah, yeah. And 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 my fear is that they're co-opting us in 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 the interlife also to really go to your deeper question. Sure, of that, course. That's where research that Jeffrey and I uh, have have done uh, separately overlap. Um, uh, you, I, I've just uh, I've, I've got a new book out coming out on the omniverse, which goes in depth into the empirical research on the human soul, mm -hmm. intelligent community of souls, and what the origin of souls are, what the function of souls in vis-a-vis -vis the multiverse and the collection of universes are, because artificial intelligence is a function of universes, it's a function of space, energy, time, and matter. Now, they have tried to create an artificial soul for the clones, which is one of the beings that they're trying to populate our future Earth, our current and future Earth with. That is, you take a clone and you clone like us, and then you, you create a human interdimensional being, which is a soul, so that you're trying to get that spark of life. However, whether or not uh, artificial intelligence has been able to infiltrate that part of creation, which is outside of the universes of time, space, energy, and matter, remains to be seen. And that, that part is the spiritual di 
mentions, uh, uh, which is the origin of source. Now, some people who I've spoken to very facilely say, oh, well, Yahweh is an artificial intelligence. In other words, God is an artificial intelligence, and uh, it just happens to be um, a little uh, better than uh, this uh, goo guy that's trying to come in. Uh, well, I think that reality goes deeper than that, and I've tried to make the case empirically. So if you want to get into in-depth, in um, without hawking a book, I would say go to our research, which goes mm -hmm. empirically and makes the distinction with the divine soul and, and its functions and its origins that's outside of time, space, energy, and matter which is the yeah. role of the artificial intelligence. Around the mid-90s, they had developed an artificial soul. So these are kind of the leading edge research questions that you're asking. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, I mean... I, I don't know if, if, if Jeffrey wants to add something or make a comment on that. Or um, Yeah, I think I... What I more what I have to say is... Um, about that is into the next couple of slides. So, okay. Um, yeah, yeah, sure. More. Yeah, well, because we, we, we are, you know, as we would, we're going to, we're already thinking ahead, which is what this whole process is all about, mm -hmm. is us sharing our, our research and ideas. So we'll go into the next one here. And I don't have them memorized. So there we go. All right. And this is another aspect of what you were already speaking of, right, Alfred? Yeah, th this is really, uh, and, and really the, the, the whole point of this is just to highlight how much our planetary leadership and all those names that you've become familiar with, uh, I mean, there are whole sectors in cyberspace that think that Ray Kurzweil is the greatest thing since sliced bread. And I'm just trying to say, hey, take a second look at this guy. Many people have taken a second look at Bill Gates because of the vaccination issues. And, of course, at Prince Charles because of the pedophile issues. But uh, uh, now we're saying take a second look at Prince Charles, Bill Gates, and Kurzweil because of the AI issues, which are the underlying condition that produces symptoms like pedophilia, repopulation through vaccinations, and the deception of the 2045 singularity when it's really 2015 singularity. Uh, uh, so what we just wanted to say here, this is bringing more evidence to the table. Uh, uh, Prince Charles, who is the heir to the British throne, the British throne owned 26% of the surface of the planet, of this planet. And that is a major Draco controller, a major AI. It's like having an, an incarnate AI, you know, controlling the, the, the judiciary. So, I mean, Americans have the tradition of having, quote, the American Revolution, even though you're inside the USA Corporation, which is actually the military contractor of the city of London and the Vatican three city state of what I call Vatlanusa. The, the US is nothing but a military contractor called the USA Corporation that has the franchise over the, the territory of the United States. And as, as Jeffrey was saying, political campaigns and elections is how you keep the locals kind of entertained, you know, in the little bread and circuses. Uh, but here you had Prince Charles, who is a direct descendant of Count Dracula and who spends a lot of his time in the year at Count Dracula's estate, actual old estate in Eastern Europe, Commissioning called upon the British Royal Society to investigate the enormous environmental and social impact of nanotechnology. That's a code word for AI. 
And the Royal Society's report on nanoscience was released in 2004, and here are the key words, declared the possibility of self-replicating machines to lie in so much in the future that it should not be of concern to regulators, meaning that, hey, guys, we've already taken over, but keep the sheeple asleep. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm just roughly translating. And and to Americans, um, I'm in a British Commonwealth country now where the head of state is the Queen of England and Prince Charles is the heir, and the head of state is the President of the United States. So this 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 matters to people around mm-hmm. the world, you know. And the world does not revolve around the United States. In other words, AI has the planet. They've got the British Commonwealth, India. I mean, it's just all over most of Africa, India, Asia. You know, it's okay. just like wake up. <laughs> Most definitely. And Prince Charles, when she came to the Yukon, she gang stalked my wife. He gang stalked my wife. These guys are gang stalkers and they have an ace intelligence agency. See, my uncle, mm-hmm. as the deputy black pope, the queen used to send the yacht Britannia to pick him up because he was listed as her spiritual advisor. So I'm not talking BS. I know these guys from the inside. Right. This is like anecdotal journalism, if you want, mm-hmm. which you know, is backed listening. up by documentation. That's what the right. Royal Society report said, and the Prince Charles is the sponsor of the Royal Society and the Royal Society's report on what they call gray goo. They call it gray goo in mm. in the official. They don't call it black goo. They call it gray goo to kind of even displace even more. I'm getting you into the fine tuning of this. So you begin to understand mm-hmm. the, the nuances and who the players are and have been. Right. It's, it's very valuable uh, because a lot of us, you know, we're all looking at it through our own particular lenses. Right. And since my lens that I've looked at all of this from has been from the same characters on the stage, but from the, uh, from the aspect of them being the black magicians. And these are only the front guys. There's the other guys that are never going to be seen. Right. So the, que- the question I would pose, because to not divert from these black magic, uh, uh, well, that has put a spell over the earth, let's call it that, has locked us into a matrix through the use of black magic, sexual abuse, uh, pedophile rings, and all of the things that we're pretty aware of. Now we're tying that to the AI. Right. So are we looking at, let's call them black spots. Okay. Black beings, they've become so black that they have now become themselves a pawn to a different, uh, this black goo or the sentient predatory pathogen. Are they just the black cells on the planet? But I'm wondering what what was first. I mean, I'm just linking those two things together because... I I, I think, you know, to bring Jeffrey's analogy in, and I'm going to turn to him as a Mm -hmm. cell biologist, because I'm sure that we'll find the answer there, is that these are, are, you know, there's a a symbiosis here uh, that's that's been happening and that has accelerated. in the in the cyberspace age, in mm-hmm. the information age, because my belief, having been in Washington, D.C. in 1982 and having Colonel Jim Channon of the 1st Earth Battalion come over from the Pentagon with printouts from ARPANET of the predecessor of the Internet, which was a mm-hmm. war machine, and it was all about tanks. And it was by right. like ARPA and DARPA was the internet. And ARPA and DARPA are the AI and trained agencies par excellence. Is that is that the internet is an is is an artificial intelligence artifact. The the mm-hmm. internet is the artifact that the invading AI intelligence created, and it's the spider web that's taking us over. Mm-hmm. And okay. that and I can draw a straight line from Colonel Jim Channon. And, and, and DARPA and ARPANET to the current internet. And the thing is that 
in in the current internet they, they have all these lots of coolness it's all cool you know it, everything is just oh it's so hip so boom 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 but that's just uh, eye candy mm -hmm. okay so you know being speaking to consciousness itself right as an expanded consciousness where we're not looking at just the immediate response mechanisms that part of uh, us as organic beings tied to an organic system of which actually I would say it's based on beauty, creativity and truth, right? This love of truth and freedom and beauty and all those things that drive us that is being usurped right now is that we need to expand that consciousness to see from outside this box too, right? The long term. Most humans on the planet have such short term memory at this point. They're like synapses that are firing off to use a, a biological term. They're just being triggered. They're like a synapsis that, that are being triggered by this internet, by the entertainment industry, by the constant babble. So just speaking to counter that uh, is like really truly is stepping out of linear time. The more we as conscious human being awareness can step out of linear time, we're actually removing a piece of their, of their what do you call it, of their armor or their, their toolbox, or whatever, their sheep. <laughs> so anyways, I just, you know, I'm getting moved by what you're saying. <laughs> Yay, I'm starting to be heard. <laughs> hey, Alfred, we all want to be heard. <laughs> okay. Maybe I can yes, lower the volume now. Yes, you, no, but Alfred, is, you hold a big, big, big picture, okay? And so when you have like Jeffrey and, and all of us and Claudia, we have these big pictures. How do we bring that into human consciousness to wake people up? That's the mission. So I'm, I'm learning a lot by listening to you. The lens I've never looked through. Thank you. What we've discovered is that the pathogenic predatory intelligence, artificial intelligence, is hosted through what we... Uh, you know, are called egoic desires, the ego, the id, etc. It's a very, you know, primitive model, but uh, power over wealth, fame, glory, status. So any way that AI can sneak in and get you on any of those, when you go into need, you know, need, uh, uh, you know, are you feeling less than? Right. It, it, it can come in. You know, in the old days, in the Middle Ages, maybe they called AI the devil. Think about that. Mm -hmm. And uh, so now we have smart devices like nanotechnologies, vaccines, frequencies, medication, mass hypnosis, trauma-based mind control, all of this world. Okay this kind of dark world is in aid of the AI uh, uh, infiltration and uh, takeover. So I think that that's, that's the essence of what we were trying to say here. Right. And the other side of saying that that way is to say that by uh, waking up and taking back your own sovereignty and your own authority, you can avoid a lot of these things. And that's what it's teaching us. Right. Yeah. To become knowledgeable about these things so that we can uh, make the right choices here. All right. So I'm just going to read this uh, slide. This is basically just a synopsis of what we went through. There's a few quotes here. All right. So our problem is to awaken to how and to what degree our consciousness and vital life energy is being harvested. If we don't know we're being harvested, we're not going to wake up. If we don't actually feel it in our in ourselves, we don't see it. They're just going to continue. And I would venture to say, from the other thing that you said, uh, uh, Alfred, was that um, that oh, gosh, never mind. Let me just get on to this. I'm gonna, going back and forth. Okay, so we have a quote from a man named Jess Whedon that says, "It's no longer enough to be a decent person." It is no longer enough to shake our heads and to make concerned grimaces at the news. True enlightened activism is the only thing that can save humanity from itself. And I think that's going to be a big part of what we're going to talk about next. Uh, 
Programmable, these are just the bullet points to, I'll read them and I don't know if we need to say any more. Programmable sentient substance, black goo, is introduced into our communication networks starting in the 1980s. World governments and leaders use all media for purposeful disinformation campaigns and propaganda. The goals of transhumanism are the result of a dark agenda and shadow governments working with off-planet technology to control humankind. All members of the ruling class are implicated unless they have turned away and become whistleblowers are those working to change the game from the inside. Hypothesis with a growing evidential base that the introduction of black goo into telecommunication systems is now operational and running the system. The philosophy of the technocrat is that life can be perfected through engineering a belief system that, while seemingly not religious, has all the markings of a religion and uses religions to achieve its agenda. Compartmentalization within governments and agencies keeps the appearance of the normalcy, and only a few are able to see the overall agenda for what it is. And then one last quote, belief in religion and government is the surest way to hand over your power. So I don't know if that sums it up enough. Um, oh, I want to say this too from this one uh, image. Each time a new person awakens to universal truth, the whole of humanity rises a notch. And I think that is a, a truth. Excellent. Yeah, okay. we're, we're kind of a, a, that's our collective mind, our collective consciousness. Exactly. And how Jeffrey was explaining earlier, how however we want to look at it through the model of time or biology, that we are all intimately connected. And uh, that one thing that happens here has repercussions that we're probably not aware of. And that is, you know, the, a part of a voice of an awakening humanity is that we start to grow our consciousness so that we do become more aware of the effects of everything that we do. All right, so we're going to, uh, we're gonna take a little dive here, what we've already talked about. Um, part of it is going to go about a little back in time here, but I'm gonna read a few things and they are uh, up for talking about, right? Because they come across as statements, but uh, source and artificial intelligence, uh, exposing the pathogenic and predatory use of AI. So it says here, the universe is fractal and digital. All matter, and matter coming from the word mother, is programmable. As organic life's life from source, we are the programmers. Our fa uh, facility to reformat matter has been co-opted. We are programmed through fear and false beliefs. The digital realm mimic, mimics source consciousness. So I don't know if anybody wants to say anything about that. It's part of what we're going to be. Well, the, these are all very profound statements. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and this, this feels like a tell them what you're about to tell them slide. Yeah. Yeah, um, mm -hmm. yeah you know, like uh, Alfred was talking about earlier. Um, yeah, the universe is fractal. Um, and digital um yeah you know could you uh, explain jeffrey what exactly fractal means yeah sure Fra um fractal um speaks to the self similarity of of the order of things so if you look at uh, like the mandelbrot fractal um the pattern or of any fractal the pattern is based on one underlying um, algorithm basically and it, it's recursive so it feeds back in on itself um, you can have fractals that you can zoom in infinitely or zoom out infinitely there's um, and you'd still be it, it would be the same underlying pattern it's just repeating uh, over on itself it's recursive um, so the idea with saying that the, the universe is fractal at least from my perspective and uh, according to the metabiological model is that because the universe is fractal um, our systems of biology reflect the order of being that exists both above and before us. So what we are is a clue to what the universe is. And this is something that, I mean, Hermes Triscogestis talked about, and people like David Bohm 
talked about. Um, and uh, so that's the, the, the fractal universe um, c- kind of speaks to that. But whereas, you know, in the Mandelbrot fractal, or you can, you can Google or YouTube um, fractal zoom and it'll, you know, you can watch a video where it'll take you into a, um, into a fractal and it's trippy. But the fractal we're talking about, the fractal universe, we're talking about a multidimensional, um, living, dynamic fractal that's evolving, you know. Um, but the patterns uh, on the different levels of the fractal correlate with one another. And um, there's an as above, so below, you know, um, aspect there to that. Now, it's a digital thing. Um, you know, I'll take that back to, uh, um, you know, in t- in Tantric cosmology or Kashmir Shaivism, they talk about the expansion and, and contraction um, of 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 the universe um, at at the most fundamental scale. They have something called sp- uh, Spanda, which is um, the it is the um, the divine pulsation. Basically, Spanda means to move a little. So um, it's the the quantum quiver. Of, of the divine creative pulsation that's that's the fundamental basis of of reality it's the, the source of all energy and all manifestation comes from this um, comes from this fan so the digital side of it and i was just reading about this uh, last night so this is kind of appropriate um is that spanda can be conceptually broken down into two parts and um it's uh unmesha and nimesha which mean expansion and contraction or um, emergence and submergence, um, display, concealing, kind of in and out um, deal. So that's there's the digital aspect of it. But they say that this that this that this breaking up into two parts of expansion and contraction are just figurative and, and conceptual conveniences for us to understand. Because in reality, the contraction and expansion are happening um, simultaneously um, at the same time. So that's that's when I see digital. Um, in terms of universe, I see that 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 digital kind of expansion and contraction happening rapidly at the same time as at the base, the most basic fundamental level that you can get this where this divine creative pulsation is taking place, the background of all reality. That there's the digital part of it for me at least. Um, so all matter is programmable. Um, I you know there's a again in metabiology there's a metabiological model for matter itself um and that ties uh our dna the 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 pattern and organization of our dna and how it's um how it's uh how it's formed and how it stores information and it ties it back to how matter is at a fundamental level you know at this um so there's in the same way as our dna can be um programmed or uh which it is constantly by in, internal stimulus and, and external stimulus. In the, in the same way, matter um, can be um, programmed. And there's also the, the the idea of dark matter in there too, you know. Um, and that's more on the non-physical side of things, which I think is more easily influenced by our psychic faculty of mind than is the matter that we're used to, which is kind of like the shell of, of the universe. Um, as organic life from source, we are the programmers. So in the same way that we, that, um, ribosomes and, and polymers can reprogram the DNA and make copies and, and call out genes from the nucleus to make proteins and create new, um, create, create and destroy too. I mean, proteins, enzymes, the enzymes are in the body and utilized by the body. Um, and they, they break down and they build, you know, um, they're metabolic catalysts. But this whole process of creation in the body, the whole entire body is encoded in the DNA in the center. So, um, and, and there's faculties uh, in the cell that help pull out this DNA, pull out the potential of form in the DNA and give it, give it a body with which to work as, which is the protein. So in the same way, at our most fundamental level in terms of um, material, you know, in terms of manifested form, there's a very subtle form of matter that, 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 uh, that is, in our core, you know, and this is a multi-dimensional thing. It's not something that you can, you know, find in a cadaver uh, with a scalpel and a, and a pocket lens. Um, but we can call out parts of this material and the information and the knowledge and the potential that's stored in our center 
and give it form. We can bring, we can manifest it, you know, and I was talking about this earlier and the, the forms that we manifest it in are the forms of art, architecture, poetry, music, language, um, and, uh, and things like that. And there's a physical form to this. And there's also a, a more subtle component, you know, a, th- a more, a more psychic thought form component that that's connected with what we bring into manifestation. And this also speaks to the whole process of building machines. There's a psychic component that we're putting into machines, you know, um, especially when we're talking about the war machine and the military industrial complex and uh, weaponization of, of, of machines. There's a psychic component to that. You know, there's intentions there that we're imbuing into the machine. So that's also something to talk about. Um, so our facility to reformat matter has been co-opted in the same way that a virus co-ops the um, facility to uh, form proteins in the cell. Um, this is this has to do with um, our, our psychic, um, our psychic, uh, our cellular psyche, so to speak. You know, Carl Jung said too. Um, Carl Jung said that he was convinced that um, that our mind correlated with the physiology of the body, and this is exactly what we're talking about with uh, metabiology. Mm-hmm. So um, we are programmed through fear and false beliefs. This is also um, this also I, I think speaks to um, uh, it has repercussions not only here but in the in the life between lives in the inner life area. Um, as far as um, you know, Robert Monroe called the belief system territories are like uh, aggregated proteins. Um, Aurobindo and the mother called it the valley of the false glimmer, where these Asuric um, and demonic false gods um, basically would trap uh, souls that were trying to figure us to, to higher regions of the astral planes. And this also is reflected in the cell. Um, and all this, like I said, I think this slide is uh, 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 talking about what we're going to talk about type deal. Mm-hmm. Um, the digital realm mimics source consciousness. Well, really, I mean, in my opinion, any realm mimics source consciousness because it's all self-contained. You know, so there's um, that aspect of it. And that's just my opinion. It's not finalized or anything, mm-hmm. but... Um, that would be, as far as going through the slide, what I had to offer. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, another way to think about, and this is something that Shane actually brought up in our when we were talking to him, that it's on the interview that Claudia and I did, and it 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 also is the penetration that we have in our ability to see into the into dark matter, to see into the unseen realms. You start to pick up signals and visuals. And it, it, it came in a way of going where a source has that first spark, that first movement in those waters. And the first manifestation came out. There also came out in that binary code. So I started to understand it myself is that the digital is actually going to be the stabilizing element, the shell, as you called it, Jeffrey, mm-hmm. that holds the consciousness or the fractal nature into some sort of form. So it's also programmable by by us it doesn't yeah. we've just turned it out in our consciousness right so mm-hmm. it doesn't it takes it out of the realm of being the bad boogeyman and puts it into the realm of being part of the whole aspect of that what we're dealing with here then that's what we're going to get yeah. into here so i'm just going to go ahead and hit the next slide if that's right, okay okay so uh This is going to take us into how we've been co-opted or bioengineered, which is is an important aspect of this. Um, I don't know. uh, There's it's really interesting. We can go as deep as we want because I'm just already looking at this uh, slide here with how Harold on it, where it says the demons lost control of to their AI, which is an interesting thing on a conversation we just had, but. So what we're looking at is that there is this black goo, all right, or gray goo or sentient oil uh, that is now on our planet. And we can look at it as invading our either our psyche consciousness or into our body. I know there are people that have come out with having black goo invasions, finding it in their blood and all of that. Um, so we're looking at it and the evidence does point that this is an off planet, alien, invasive, sentient, artificial type intelligence or predatory. Um, some, uh, people that are looking at it are saying it came from outside the universe, but some, but something brought it here. However, now that it's here, we have a a very strange, uh, uh, now very well documented disease called Morgellons 
which we can be looking at as it's wiring the human body for takeover. Uh, it's definitely, uh, there are definitely wires in the body. There's strange crystals. There's even been things seen as insect bodies crawling out of the human that have this Morgellons disease. Uh, I just want to bring in here too the important work, uh, Dangerous Imagination and Silent Assimilation by, uh, who was uh, co-authored with Cara St. Louis. She goes into a lot of the mind entrainment, right? So we have a biological entrainment and a corresponding mind parasite or mind entrainment. And also that uh, through the Morgellons and the Black Goo, we're talking about DNA technologies and mRNA manipulations, which Harold goes uh, into pretty well in his his interviews. Um, and I've always you know, wanted to ask you, Jeffrey, too, about, uh, he talks about, uh, we're going to go into it, but maybe we'll wait till we get to the right slide about how this fungal sort of uh, neural transmitter that is is literally taking over the body. And uh, I'm just going to, unless somebody wants to say more about Harold, I'm super interested in in what uh, he's brought forward to us. His also his own personal journey is very poignant. Um, as you said earlier, didn't you? Uh, Alfred said something about him. Yes, yes. I, I found um, that that Harold is an individual researcher and a scientist <clears throat> uh, uh, who has really taken uh, a very deep journey uh, into this and has provided the world, I think, with a very valuable uh, body of knowledge and body of work which i think you can find at his youtube channel and mm -hmm. there are uh, many many articles and he's written a book uh which i which i've read uh with cara with cara st louis um and uh on the ai and uh integrating it with uh a lot of anthropological and sociological information that that I think makes more transparent uh, the templates and the matrix of uh, 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 that uh, say the the nineteenth and twentieth and now the twenty first century uh, sort of that interface between the AI and the governments and the sociology and the societies and the information. And mm -hmm. I found that to be a very illuminating book. And um, uh, so I, I send all power and, and all support to, to Harold and mm -hmm. as an individual and, and, as a, and as a researcher. Um, I know that uh, uh, facing the AI on a personal level is is uh, is very strenuous. This is uh, this is a guy I call it Iggy, <laughs> the All Planet Intelligence, uh, uh, inorganic artificial intelligence Iggy. That just and uh, it, it likes to get very personal w with you and. Uh, 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 you know, even last night, myself, uh, uh, in the middle of the night, uh, aside from being uh, attacked with all kind of nightmarish stuff in preparation for our symposium today, which was transmitted through a cell phone, this is my hypothesis, in the middle of the night, I was thrown off of our bed and I landed on the ground and it had uh, turned this kind of this glass, sharp glass, so I just missed my head. So this is, uh, you know, uh, I, I can identify with much of the journey, the, the researcher's journey, because you're kind of an anthropologist mm -hmm. that goes down into the AI and stares at face to face. Mm -hmm. and so I, I really uh, send him a lot of support. And I urge people to go to his information, which I think is probably some of the 
uh, scientifically more rigorous and uh, illuminating uh, hypotheses that are around. So that's my kind of uh, uh, sharing about Hal's journey. And I hope he, he sort of taking a, in accordance with his last public statement as of today, which is October 19th, 2015, he's kind of taken a, a step back to take a breather from this area. But we hope that he will, uh, once again, maybe uh, we'll send him a few copies of our symposium today and he'll get recharged and maybe he can join us in a future symposium. That's be, that'd be very wonderful. And I join you in that. And I'm, you know, to, to finish off this slide, if it's okay, I want to read from the book uh, uh, from him in Dangerous Imagination, Silent Assimilation. Um, a lot of what we're talking about can be said ultimately in a very few words. And the very last line here is a very, very important one for us to begin to understand. The governments are giving control to the military domain. The military domain is giving control to the intelligence community. The intelligence community is giving control to the black magicians. The black magicians are giving control to the demons. And the demons lost control to their AI. It is not about changing government because the entire concept of governments is demonic. It's not about replacing people. It will never work. We need to replace the game. And I will concur with that statement that this is what we're looking at uh, because we have actually a world a government structures, systems have all been taken over. So, um, and so mm -hmm. it, it's like uh, uh, politics, religion, government, all of that kind of Anunnaki legacy is all right. AI. Exactly, right. So you know this is this I mean, it really puts it in 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 right in your face. So we need to replace the game, and we're going to talk about that too. So. All right. Um, again, I'm, I'll just read from here, and we can add anything that we want to. We're going to be looking at it more. Bioengineering, a very broad area of study. Bioengineering can include elements of electrical and mechanical engineering, computer science, materials, chemistry, and biology. So I know there's so much out there already to deal with, um, you know, how this bioengineering or uh, of specifically of our earth and our organic structures has been done, but we need to look at chemtrails. Uh, research on chemtrails is that what they're spraying from our skies is part of not only terraforming the planet, and we'll get into that too, but also the bioengineering of the, the biological structure of the human genome. So it's known that they start to make crystals in our, in our structure. Uh, Harold does a lot of stuff where he talks about the pyretic crystals and mRNA, where they become a transmitting point for these frequencies that are being beamed onto the human at all time, basically turning us into a receptor a receptor for the artificial intelligence, frequencies, microwaves, scalar, all of the ways that they, smartphones, all plasma, all of the ways that they've been trying to actually turn us into uh, biological puppets for this agenda. Um, I just actually, one of the things that I keep doing and finding and sharing is that a lot of the words that are, are used in biology are also used in computer sciences now. Pyretic is also one of them, okay? So the computer scientists of Princeton have developed a programming language called Pyretic that makes controlling the flow of data packets. So somehow in our data transfer through the RNA, which Jeffrey understands a heck of a lot better than I can even begin to describe, they've putting in these pyretic crystals and so they're making, they're controlling the flow of the data within our biology. Even, you know, so, and I, the more I look at this, Harold, I mean, uh, our Alfred, like you, like with the numbers and the dates and they all mean something, that computing science is actually mimicking biology in the terms of their programs. Um, so we have 
the known uh, thing that we are beings of frequency, that we are resonant in our nature, that we are sound, we admit sound, we're resonant. So all of this is being directed at controlling the human being in this vessel. And I don't know how much we want to go deeply into it. It's so much out there about it. I mean, there's recommended research on all of this, uh, but it all adds up to control of the human genome or the human DNA, turning us into robots, where we lose our own divine source connection, severing us from that. So I don't know if anybody wants to add anything here in this, and Jeffrey, maybe you do, or Claudia. Claudia. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. I'm is the next. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Sorry, my internet is playing up tonight like crazy. Um, I just want to add that it's up to each of us whether we allow it. I I find that lots of us tend to overlook this that we only see the fear factor of AI taking over everything, including ourselves, that we actually have to allow it for it to happen. If we don't allow it, if we stay true to ourselves, um, as organic beings, for lack of a better word, um, then it's not going to happen, then it cannot happen. Right. Can you describe a little bit um, when we say not allow it, how, how you know, I mean, I, I'm playing with it a little bit because I know we play with the aspect of, of sound being creation itself, right? So we have frequencies, we have microwaves and all of that. So if you were to describe not allowing it, um, how would you describe that to uh, how do we not allow it? Well, all we have to do really is to decide that this is not what we want. Right. It's so beautiful. Yeah. We're, <laughs> right. we're collect I mean, we're collectively bringing this into being, you know. Mm -hmm. um, we're giving a form to our own darkness, basically. Um, I mean, it might not be... Um, directly from us i mean it might i mean what i mean to say is it could have come in externally but um it wasn't i mean we're not victims you know um there was uh, a part that's that we key. yeah the, a part that we played in it. Yeah. we are not victims yeah. right and uh, let's say that one again because this is probably the one overriding uh, meme that is embedded in human consciousness is that we do not have power and we are victimized by things. And so that returning to that hundred percent aspect of I am, I am, I am responsible. I am creator. Therefore I have the abilities within me to detach from these uh, invading predatory things. And you said it too, Jeffrey, and that's going to be more is that this is actually an outplaying, maybe not individually, maybe it's not Claudia, maybe it's not Alfred, maybe it's not Jeffrey. Maybe some of us have done enough deep inner work in our dark shadow self that we're no longer engaged with these, we're no longer being used, but we're in a collective here. We're in a collective. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what more is it going to take is to work out the dark collective mm -hmm. that is being manifest right now? There's also, speaking to what Claudia said about allowing it, um, there's a quote by Carl Jung, um, whom I love. Um, <laughs> he says, uh, first of all, in a separate video, you know, he talks about that we are the source of all the coming evil. Um, now, I mean, I don't really like that word evil, but um, the idea is that um, there's our, our role in it and our, you know, our part in um, in our responsibility and our power of choice and our power of meeting ourselves and not denying these um, uh, aspects of creation and saying, Oh, this is, this is, um, this isn't a part of me. You know, there's a, there's an element of discernment there and that, yes, it's all self-contained, but there's, um, we have intentions and we've chosen a, a certain um, path in terms of uh, evolution, you know, towards 
self-knowledge, you know, and, and, and that path is one of um, expansion, um, is one of expansion. And there is, there's a role that division plays in that. I mean, eukaryotic cells are cooperative. They form organs that form um, larger beings, such as, you know, humans, for example, or animals. But it's necessary for an organism that is on this path of, of forming larger organs and larger beings and having a larger identity of, as a body made up of many parts. Division is essential to that. The cell has to divide, you know. So the other side of the evolutionary pathway is one of, um, you know, division and destruction. And there's also a part of um, the expansion in that side too, you know. It's like the yin and the yang symbol with the, the white chasing the, the black, the light chasing the darkness. And there's a dot of darkness inside the light and there's a di- dot of you know, uh, light inside the darkness still. Um, but speaking specifically to what Claudia was saying and tying it into what Carl Jung says, and when she said, um, allowing it to happen, um, Carl Jung has a quote where he says, there's no coming to consciousness without pain. People will do anything, no matter how absurd, in order to avoid facing their own soul. One does not become enlightened by imagining figures of light but by making the darkness conscious. So what we're doing right now in summoning the beast, you know, um, is giving form to everything that we've denied as part of ourselves, everything that we've shamed and guilt and been afraid of, all of our anger and, you know, repressed fears and desire to kill each other. We're pouring these into the machines that we're bringing into the world. Specifically, I'm talking more specifically to the military industrial complex and the war machine that they're birthing into the world. You know, um, this is we were talking about this the other day. This is like an antigen presenting cell, and we're going to get into the chromosomes deal. But that um, in an antigen presenting cell in the body absorbs the pathogen, okay, absorbs it into itself, and then digests it and discerns it and separates it and displays it on its surface and then the immune cell uh, immune cell such as a killer t cell comes and um uh basically takes that pathogen so it can um bring it back to um, the place where they create more uh antibodies or or more cells to fight that specific type of pathogen so in a way um allowing it to happen in the development of, of technology and AI or whatever in the you know, militarization and weapon, weaponization of machines. This is like antigen presentation. We're like displaying all of our um, all of our pain and fear and shame and ill will towards one another and putting it, you know, giving them form in, in, in the form of the war machine that is the military industrial complex or whatnot. And there's not one of us who can pretend that we don't have, uh, you know, this... Um, a little bit of this element inside of us, you know, I mean, everybody's got in some part of their ego that they're um, not willing to admit or accept as part of themselves, but part of the process of transformation is making the darkness conscious. And you think, you know, you don't want to, you don't want to do that, but that that's part of the magic of it is the light of our own conscious awareness, exposing it is part of the healing process, you know, just like the antigen presenting cells. There's a connection there is all, all I'm suggesting. Mm-hmm. But um, oh, beautiful. So, so just as so so. <laughs> the are um, we about to talk about the Akari? Is yes, we're going to go there. Let's go there. Let's okay, go there. Okay. That's, yeah, that's. Yeah. Um. Come on. Okay. There you go. Next slide. Uh, this is this is it. Incredible to look at. Can I read just some quotes I took from you sure. <laughs> before you launch? Mm-hmm. Okay. So this is, you know, just also to this exploration has been going on with Claudia, myself, and Jeffrey for quite a while in different conversations, sharing information. Uh, a lot of the things well, that we each keep bringing to to the consciousness. So they, I love that, Jeffrey. It's like making the dark conscious, like bringing it to the light. So this is really the act, the act of what we're doing right now. So Jeffrey said to me one day when we were exploring, transhumanism, people start really putting some serious circuitry into their bodies. Eventually, a type of fungus and akari will start growing inside. Now, this is Morgellons. 
this is more well, happening, so, yeah. right? It is happening. Yeah, you can go into more of it. Okay. And the fungus that precedes the Akari is the internet and the telecommunication grid. The internet telecom grid is the physical manifestation, the beginnings of a planetary astral fungus. So, yeah. yes. Yeah, the internet fungus deal is um, a couple of slides in, so this is kind of like a foreshadowing one, but the Akari one is um, what's interesting. So Andrew Cross, um, he, let's see, this is from the Literary Gazette, a weekly journal of literature, science, and the fine arts, and this was um, published in the 1800s sometime, and it was about, uh, there's an article in there about Akari's research, and it's written by um, a man who is associated with his research. Um, w. H. Weeks was his name. Um, I'm just going to read a few excerpts just so people can get the general idea of what was going on. It's just a pithy explanation of um, what Andrew Cross found. So in 1837, Andrew Cross reported to the London Electrical Society concerning the accidental, spontaneous generation of life in the form of acarus genus insects. While he was conducting experiments on the formation of artificial crystals by means of prolonged exposure to weak electrical currents. Through numerous strict experiments, under a wide variety of conditions, utterly inimical to life as we know it, the insects continued to manifest. In other words, he had solutions of, of potash that were um, highly poisonous, toxic, or acidic, and he had boiled them and put them, uh, sealed the jar with uh, mercury, and um, injected uh, um, oxygen into the jar that had come from a white hot. Uh, uh, it made, made sure that there were no forms of life that, and that the jar was completely um, uh, sanitized. And um, these insects still started to grow in the, uh, in the, on the negative end of the galvanic cell that he had set up, of the basically battery that he had set up. Um, Michael Faraday also reported to the Royal Institute that he had replicated the experiment, uh, the experiment and W.H. Weeks is another man who had replicated it. Um, so what's interesting is that he also reported the growth of a fungus um, that preceded the growth of the Akari um, when there was a uh, sugar involved, uh, a thin, uh, thin layer of sugar involved. And that is on... I just had, I just had, um, okay, here it is. Okay, um, this one's a book, it's another book from the 1800s, I think, that's uh, called Universality of the Lower Organisms and Their Varieties, and it talks about W.H. Weeks' experiments and Andrew Cross. Um, so, Mr. Weeks also describes another experiment in which a thin solution of refined sugar was submitted to continuous electric action. The result was the, produ the production of a peculiar fungus different from any previously known and which only came under the electrical influence. Both this and the insects, it is worthy of remark, always appeared in connection with the negative pole of the battery. Uh, this is also from W.H. Weeks. About the beginning of September 1843, a small patch of fungus of a peculiar character was observed to have commenced forming on the outside of the glass near the, its lower rim. This substance having, when first seen, a gelatinous appearance of dark brown color, by slow degrees extended itself around the lower rim of the glass, forming an irregular band or zone, half an inch in breadth, and throwing out numerous protuberances as it approached the positive side of the arrangement. And then he goes on to describe... Um, that he looked at this uh, with a pocket lens, looked at the fungus and saw that it looked like a, a miniature forest. And then he saw that Akari insects had started forming in the, in the fungus so that they were somehow that they're connected with the fungus and that they were like living in the forest of the fungus. <laughs> um, so why this is interesting is because um, I think uh, you have all the ingredients basically of what... Uh, of of of, of um, Andrew Cross's and W H Weeks' experiments on the Earth right now. Um, so we have, uh, and they talk about this too. Um, let's see. I had this all 
all set up and uh, I had to open extra windows and I lost where it was. Hmm. I can't seem to find it. But yeah, the idea is that Morgellons is connected with this, um, mm -hmm. but not not in the not in the terms of of, of uh, putting electrical circuitry in the body, but more more on the terms of that there's there's thousands of galvanic cell in in your own head, you know, in your own body, um, that there's um, redox reactions that take place in galvanic batteries are taking place in the body, and that um, we're constantly submitted to uh, electrical influence in the form of electromagnetic smog and, you know, Wi-Fi signals and all this. So um, the idea is that the Earth itself has its own unique morphogenic field that may be may be physically connected to um, the, uh, what's that, 7 hertz frequency? I just lost it on the Earth. Oh, the, the Schumann resonance? Yeah, the Schumann resonance. Mm -hmm. that, that may be, you know, physically connected to that. And there may be non-physical aspects with the morphogenetic field or whatnot. But the thing is, is that this electromagnetic smog, as it's called, that's created by, all, um, you know, all the Wi-Fi and the, um, the uh, basically radiation that we're, pumping out into the environment is blanketing that natural frequency and creating a space for a new type of um, uh, morphogenetic field, basically. And this could, like the first instances that we're seeing of a fungus growing um, inside the human. Remember it said that the fungus needed sugar. Mm -hmm, exactly. Grow. And, the, you know, um, that's, I mean, there's plenty of sugar in the body to grow. And, um, you know, it also needs uh, uh, an aesthetic type environment. Well, I mean, our diets right now, I mean, they're pretty bad, you know, all the all the junk food and, and fast food out there and, you know, the problem with obesity and everything and acidity uh, and pH is a big um, issue. Acidic uh, blood and, uh, and the brain can also have an acidic pH, uh, which is connected with various other things. Anyway, it's interesting because all the ingredients that Andrew Cross used are kind of there almost but on a on a dispersed scale um mm -hmm. right now on, on the planet so that would be interesting now the transhumanism part i think is in a, a slide further uh, right further yeah. down uh, I, right so just with the archaea insects and I'm, i have on the slide i have archons and archaea insects right oh, that's, yes and the reason right okay could could i ask something uh I'm not familiar with the term Akari. Could, could yes, you explain yeah. the, the origin and meaning of that term? Um, Akari um, is a uh, taxon. It's a it's a, a branch of um, arachnids, basically. So I see. Eight yeah, and that's what's even more interesting is that they're connected with um, arachnids. So Akari, uh, Akari are things like termites. I mean, not termites. I'm sorry. Akari are things like mites and ticks. Those are Akari. So Andrew Cross said that this was a, a different form, a different variety of Akari that was electrical in nature that only developed under these um, conditions that he had set up. Um, so, yeah, Akari is connected to spiders. Basically, they're in the subclass of, of arachnids. That's the only way that they're uh, connected. And they're also connected with this fungus that was forming. So that's also a, a point of interest. Right. So, so you're making uh, uh, just in this page many of the themes that you've made throughout our our symposium and in this PowerPoint are really embodied in this page, where you where you start out from the biological the cellular model to the biological model then up to the internet mm -hmm. and and uh so that this begins to uh substantiate uh uh more political hypotheses more hypotheses that are more based on political and it and uh organizational factors that i've been putting forward that the that the internet itself is an AI uh, is an AI artifact and 
and and and manifestation. So you're really going through through the whole cycle of 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 evolution here. Is is that the case? Yeah, actually, and this is talked about in, in slides further down. Is that this particular pathogen that we're dealing with? You know, you talk about the universe being a fractal and as above, so below, and that if we can find the right reference scopes, we can map um, certain uh, characters to each other, and that reveals a pattern that's being displayed from a higher level to a lower level. And we look at the um, evolution of, of uh, a pathogen and the, the um, infection sequence and the stages that it goes through. Um, we can map it to uh, planet-wide what happens with um, the Akari and the fungus. And there's a non-physical aspect to it, too, that, that we're going to discuss. And that the, the equivalent of the fungus to the Akari is the Internet, what the Internet is to the, um, to the Earth as, as this as part of a as a stage as a ve vegetative phase of the infection sequence of this planetary you know meta pathogen that we're dealing with and it's, it really gets pretty deep into it too i don't know how many slides mm -hmm. down it is but um it's uh well the, this this begins to get to the deception where the internet is being sold to us as the greatest thing since sliced bread and and that it's it's the global brain and without it and and we're and we're entering this great new vista, whereas in fact if you apply a different analysis, it's an acceleration of the parasitical takeover of artificial intelligence. Am I missing yeah. something here? No, it's a fungus, and it's interesting because right. if you look at um, the pleomorphic theory of germs, you know Antoine Bechamp and um, and Claude Bernard, um, they they don't they talk about that the terrain is everything. The germ is, is nothing. Um, basically, the environment mm -hmm. dictates the the pathogen, and that it's not necessarily a pathogen that's looking. There's not like hordes of microbes looking to attack and infect people. It's that the um, the terrain, these uh, microbes are benign more or less, and, until the the terrain changes in which they mutate in order to um, uh, metabolize the food that's available in their environment. So in other words, when the body becomes acidic, for instance, um, just as a simple example, you'd have, um, you'd have microbes uh, uh, mutating into a pathogenic uh, life cycle in order to metabolize the food that's available. And then if it stays like that, they go further down the infection, I mean, the, um, the mutation sequence their pathogenic mutation sequence um, and start breaking down the body as if the body were dead so in one of those stages um, it goes through a viral stage um, and then a bacterial stage uh, and then there's different types of bacterial stages and then it enters into a fungal stage where there's mycelium and right now we're in the fungal stage the mycelium is the internet um, and mycelium is basically uh, made up of hypha which is on another slide, I think, soon. Um, but you can map you can map all this stuff pretty closely, um, right? And and what's the stage after the mycelium stage? Well, they start forming sporocarps. So what, spor sorry? they start forming sporocarps, where a sporocarp basically means a seed body. So um, they start getting ready to release um, their spores, more or less. So this would be the stage of when the virus is ready to lyse the cell, either it'll lyse the cell or it'll sneak out of the cell. But um, after it's done replicating, it needs to. Very, very interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Jeffrey. Before I move on to the next slide, because we're going to talk, we have a slide about Gnostics and Gnosticism and uh, some of the, the, the correlating thing in, is like all of the different sciences from biology to exopolitics to geology, anthropology, Everything's telling us a story. And it, part of doing this right now is trying to find that pattern of what is the story really saying. And I just want to bring into one aspect here that's a uh, hypothesis, although John Lash put it forward, is that when Sophia, the Aeon Sophia came out of Galactic Center and formed herself in the body of Gaia, there was an electrical discharge, an enormous electrical discharge. And we can, we can understand that if we think of celestial bodies moving through time and space, the friction that they 
they discharge as they're doing something. So saying that she or Sophia or Gaia, we can call her, incarnated into the physical earth body, there was this immense discharge. And what he proposes or says is that it provoked, that's when the archons took form. It was almost as an accident or it wasn't planned on. And so I'm just bringing that into electrical discharges and the formations of these different types of life forms. Um, and when I, when he did say that, you know, he's making a correlation that this archonic entity, right, that it was made from this great electrical discharge, that it is the invasive species on the planet. And that he says that it came in through, it's a mind parasite to begin with. And it came in through the ear canal and provoke, it started a fungal growth within the, the, uh, the brain cavity, as it were. And that's how it started taking over the human consciousness and the worship of itself and a lot of things that we might talk about a little bit. Just wanted to bring those two pieces together since they're both on this slide. So also recommending for people that they go to John Lash's, uh, uh, I think it's called Meta History. And, and look at his chapters on the Gnostics. And, uh, and he's not the only scholar researcher out there with an interpretation, but it's a valuable one. Thank you.